We have playing time th- to talk about, as always. We have a handful of pitchers we're going to break down from their last couple starts. Some uh, hitters that are starting off hot or slow. I'm answering a few of your questions in terms of in terms of playing time, or sorry, sorry, in terms of player breakdowns. We're getting into all that and more today. So we're going to start right away with none other than Nick Pavetta. Nick Pavetta is off to a strong start, and I feel like we've seen this before. We've played this game before, and uh, it is what it is with Pavetta. But what caught my attention is that right now, early on, the four-seamer is up in velo, and then you also have the curveball up in velo, which only matters if you're getting more movement on it because otherwise increased velocity in secondaries doesn't really matter all too much. Let's see if he has any uh, increase. Let's see the curveball. Curveball is actually lost. See, so sometimes what happens is you actually lose movement when you throw a, a ball far, a hard, harder. So the curveball lost some vertical movement, gained a little bit of horizontal movement. But the uh, cutter, he added a cutter this year. He's throwing it only 7.1% of the time, but it is a fourth offering, technically a fifth offering. He's pretty much dropping the change away when he barely utilized last year. I wouldn't really call the cutter a true fourth pitch for him because he's throwing it so little. It's exclusively against righties for the most part as well, but it is another option for him. And maybe that's what's playing into the uh, curve. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it's it was curve. I have no idea. But uh, the the changeup, it's it's showing promise. But the issue is, is he's barely throwing it. So we'll see if he changes up the utilization of the changeup. At least that's what my notes say. Let me see if that's true. I tend to mess things up a little bit here while I'm doing these notes. I, I put the wrong pitch down. Yeah, the changeup has a whole bunch of different movement. You see the what we're talking about like five, about five inches of vertical movement change there, but barely throwing it. It's really not all that uh, all that different. So uh, what I'm getting at though, pretty much increased velocity, the addition of a new pitch. Pavetta has some interesting things going on. We also know him to run hot and cold, so it could just be a hot streak. However, at least there are some notable early changes going on here. Next player we're going to talk about is going to be Bryce Elder. Elder, well, uh, there's he's kind of just a guy, but in deeper formats, he has value. There's a lot of win potential here with the Braves. The Braves are playing really good baseball right now. And early on with Elder, he's producing, but there's a little bit of changes going on in here. You're seeing a, a 13% change in utilization of the slider. You're seeing about a uh, 12% drop in usage of the sinker. And in the process, he's actually getting more strikeouts early on. Again, not a huge strikeout guy by any means. Elder's not going to strike out many players. But what he is doing is he is getting some strikeouts with it. And that's like the sum that he's getting is better than what he's been doing in his career. So Elder has, a, I wouldn't say the strikeouts are really an upside thing here, but overall early production paired with team context, there's a lot to like here for Elder. Not to mention, uh, see, and that's another thing. The key results also seem rather lucky considering he has a below average O swing, which is a chase rate of 26 point, uh, 28.6%, and a below average swing strike rate of 11%, which that's pretty much league average. But the fact that he has league average and below league average in some of these major metrics suggests that the strikeouts probably will go back more towards his career norms. He's more of like a six to seven strikeout per nine type of guy. And so, and one thing that's good about Elder before we move on is the fact that he keeps the ball on the ground a lot, 50% ground ball rate. That will play. Shane Bieber. I don't really know how to feel about Bieber. So with Bieber, it's a, it's, I don't like it. Great ratios. Great at keeping the ball on the ground, 45.5% ground ball rate. He has elite command and control, but the strikeouts for the second straight season are trending in the wrong direction. We're talking about a guy the velo's down and it's sustaining down for Bieber. The third, this is going on. This is going to be the second straight year. Sorry, the third straight year that we've seen a K minus walk rate decrease. And it's as of right now, it's only 13.7%. And that's because he doesn't walk anybody. The strikeouts are way down right now. And other than elite ratios and innings, and obviously wins, he's not, it's not that he's not valuable, but the strikeouts aren't there. He loses a lot of his appeal and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, just mediocrity here. I, I think Bieber's a solid pitcher. I don't know if he'll return draft day value with the current outlook of his underlying metrics. Obviously, you're going to see some home runs. He hasn't even given up one yet. But still, it's I, the upside is so limited with that velo dip and the lack of strikeouts that hopefully he can turn it around. 200 innings, if he can reach that again. He'll still provide value considering, again, how pitching has been going. But you were expecting closer to a K in inning, at least like with 200 innings, you're expecting closer to 
180 to 200 Ks. Now, if this sustains, he's looking at like 170 ish on the high end at the current pace he's on. So Bieber's strikeouts are just something we're watching here. Not necessarily something you need to be overly concerned about. Well, I wouldn't say you shouldn't be overly concerned. You should be somewhat concerned, but I just, it's, I think it's just too early to overreact is what I'm trying to get at here with Bieber. Brandon Marsh is running hot. And I don't know, again, we're talking early, small samples here, but Brandon Marsh is doing really, really good things. You like to see, you like to see what he's doing. You're seeing a first pitch swing rate is below 5%. He is being beyond patient. This comes with a, uh, 24.1% O swing rate uh, rate and then a 5.8% swing strike rate for reference league average for the O swings roughly 31 32% usually and league average for the swing strike rate is about 11 and a half percent so he is way above average while being over while being so patient while being able to actually pick his spots he has a 97% Z contact rate right now so he is seeing the ball as good as anyone he is not swinging he's not aggressive and when he does swing in the zone he is hitting the ball the bad whip is going to regress. It's 474 for Marsh. The ground balls, 52.4%. Not a ground. You don't want to see ground balls be that high. That is a concern and an issue. But everything else is looking really good here. He's uh he's also, I think he's his hard hit rate stuff is actually pretty solid too. Yeah, 42.9% hard hit rate. His barrel rate is low. Unfortunately, he has one barrel in the year, 4.8%. So that's an issue. The power won't play up. But again, it goes back to the fact that he's hitting a lot of the balls on the ground. So if he can get maybe if he starts elevating the ball more, we can see that power play up. However, he has stolen base, two home runs, and great play discipline, great batting average. He's a good fifth outfield type, tough in shallower lit formats than that. Geraldo Gir- Gir- Perdomo. If you are desperate for shortstop because every shortstop got injured <laughs> over the last few days, Perdomo is a guy you should consider. You have you have a change in a, in a, a change in approach here for Perdomo. Not only is he in a strong side platoon, so those are path, path to playing time. He's limiting swing and miss. He's slightly more aggressive while remaining with uh, with while sustaining those contact rates that he usually has, which are pretty solid. He's elevating the ball a ton. He's pulling the ball more than ever. And overall, the pull like the pull line drive rate is also up. So it's like fifty seven point one percent pull line drives. Pull fly ball rate is twenty eight point six percent. Obviously, trying to get that power up. The issue being that he just lacks barrels early on, lacks the hard like the hard hit rates up or no, it was oh sorry, it was up. It was now it's down today. But he's, he has no barrels on the year. He's never been a guy to barrel the ball much. So if Perdomo with the change in approach can't produce, can't get good contact on the ball, I don't know if the power will come around like we expect it could. He does have a home run early on, never been a big home run guy. But with this type of approach, usually you're taking you're doing you're usually you're usually utilizing this type of approach when you're trying to produce power and i just have a hard time seeing the power produce considering the, some of these underlying metrics but he's hitting really well 368 on the year obviously inflated bad bit in the process 555 45 but all things considered perdomo is a i am desperate i need a shortstop play in deeper formats another one of those is going to be jose barrero actually jose barrero he gets to call cincinnati home that is fantastic some fun things about uh Barrero though is the fact that you know he's not his strikeouts vastly improved we're talking a guy that's been striking out 30 35 to 45 percent of the time at the major league level never showed those types of strikeouts out uh, in the minors and then it looks like he's improved it at least early on in the year Barrero has an 18.2 percent strikeout rate early on however it's not necessarily going to sustain considering some of the underlying metrics if we go down to the plate discipline metrics here you can see that he has a 51.1% O swing and a 20.3% swinging strike rate. League average, again, 11.2% swing strike rate and 31.6% O swing. He is swinging outside of the zone 20% more on average and swinging through strikes 9% more on average. He's doing this now while still making okay contact. He's below average on contact because he's just wildly aggressive. His swing rate is 14% higher than the average person right now. He is swinging at everything, making enough contact, but the fact is, is I don't see how this is going to sustain an 18% strikeout rate. So it might just be, it's more of a mirage. I wouldn't be overly aggressive on him. He's like a few dollars guy. If you're desperate in a, in a, like a main event, like a 15 teamer, you're looking at, I don't know, probably 10 to $20 range, maybe. And that's even pushing. Cause I just don't, th- I, but again, it depends what's out there. I know he's kind of one of the better options, so to speak. So he might even go for more because team context, league context, but he's playing every day calls Grand America, small park home. It's hard to really ignore that in formats where you're super needy for uh for super needy for 
for playing time. And I see a question about Jose Abreu. Let's talk about Jose Abreu real quick. Thank you for the question, Logan. Uh, Jose Abreu, are we concerned? No, it's. I mean, I'm not really concerned about anybody here. We're gonna pull it up. We'll, we'll look him up on the fly here too. We'll just we'll look. I saw him hitting well early on. He slowed down. It's kind of like two mix. It's like a mixed bag of like production. The strikeouts are uncharacteristic. He's still hitting 280. Like he's still hitting really well. Just a little more strikeouts than usual. A little less walks. He might be pressing new team. Uh, you know, some parts missing in that lineup. Trying to maybe produce a little more than he should than he has to. Uh, stat cast data he's still hitting the ball hard just not as hard as usual not making his, his usual barrel right these are things that i expect to correct themselves considering that the, the track record we have here with abreu but again it makes sense that these are kind of the issues he's dealing with considering like the numbers are a little off here the power numbers are off well he's not barreling the ball as much he's not hitting the ball as hard right now that would explain it i do think it's just an early season blip on the radar i do understand abreu is getting older but I'm not overly concerned right now. And yeah, like right now, again, very uncharacteristic. He's chasing more than ever. He's swinging. His swing strike rate is higher than ever. Contacts are way down. I can understand being concerned. Again, new uh, the whole fact that the fact that it's a new team and the fact that he's getting older. I don't think he just fell off a cliff, though. I, I don't think his profile is usually rather safe. I know he's 36 years old, as you can see on here if you're watching live on YouTube. But uh, I'm, I'm, it's too early to be concerned about Brayu. I, I trust the track record here more, even though the age is there. The age is concerned now. Next month, if he's doing this going into like mid-May, then there's obviously more reason for uh, concern. But maybe right now you bench Brayu if you're if you're de- if you need power. But even with the even with those bad metrics, he's still hitting 280. He's still hitting in the middle of that order. One of the better lineups in baseball, even while missing pieces. It's hard for me to envision sitting him. But if you're if you're in a shallower format. He's not a drop. But he's definitely a sit. He can be a sit right now. And you mentioned the ground ball, right? I saw you. I saw you mentioned the ground ball right form. I didn't see that on the quick look. It's about the same as all. I mean, that's why because it was about the same. It's still more than you want, forty eight point six percent. But it's it's about what he's been doing. He's a forty six percent career ground ball guy. But Abreu, that's the Jose Abreu we spoke about right there on the fly. Let's. So uh, yeah, that was. Of course, Logan. No worries. For those listening, he said thank you. And again, if you're listening on the podcast. Five star rating reviews greatly appreciated. First off, secondly, check out the YouTube channel, youtube.com at GTE Fantasy, and you can watch all the stuff breaking down. I actually made the every, I made the screens bigger today, so everyone could actually see stuff, not squint. We're gonna move on over to Josiah Gray. He is a big name right now, a hot name, I should say. He's still kind of tough, like in 15 teamers. And look at curveball placement <laughs> for those looking on the screen. That it's like he's hitting his own lot with that curveball, but there's a lot to like here because he's changing things up in a big way. If you look at if you look at him, the big notable changes going on so far, the pitch mix change, more sliders, more curves, and more cutters, a lot less four seam. This four seamer, I mean, it's still getting hit hard this year. So is the cutter. Anything he throws straight, the sinker, not so bad, but it's also his fifth most uh, it's his second to last most thrown pitch. He's thrown one change up this year. Fine, he dropped the change up altogether. The sinker, 8.2%, still up from last year, but overall. He has four pitches above 14.7% usage or more, and the sinker is not one of them. Maybe that changes because he's having more success with the sinker early on than he is with the fastball and the cutter. The fastball is getting good whiffs. 35.7% is a good whiff rate for a four-seamer, but he's also allowing pretty hard, like pretty good numbers, like a 500 batting average against uh, X Woba 460. It's he again dropped the usage of this fastball well, over 20% from last year, but it is still very hittable. However, the secondaries he is leaning more on. Josiah Gray is really leaning on that slider curveball combo, throwing the two combined for over 55% of the time. And that's up from last year where he was throwing them a lot, but he wasn't leaning on them as much. And this year he's really leaned on them while adding that cutter to the mix. Just another way to keep hitters guessing, I would I would say at this point. So Gray, a lot of interesting things going on. Something about him I noticed is although he, he's getting more extension, He's getting more extension on his pitches. He's still below average, and below average means that the fastballs are usually easier to see. Like an ex- a fastball that might go like 90 would look like 88, for instance, if it's below average. So that extension can actually be an issue for Gray. It, it, it could be actually why, what plays into the fastball being an issue, but there are smarter people that would know a lot more like Eno and, and Alex Fast, et cetera. Is, is Tyler Ward a sell high candidate? No, I would hold. He was. There's a reason why you drafted him where you did. I would say ward what we're seeing is ward healthy we saw how good he was at the beginning of last year we saw how good ward was at the end of last year a hot start isn't just necessarily a hot start for him 
he was got he was kind of going in a valuable range. That's why he was very very popular amongst Twitter analysts and amongst all of our, all analysts as a sleeper, as a breakout, as a whatever you want to call him, a really good value in drafts. It, it always depends what you can get in return, Chris. But all things considered, I would be holding on to Ward because I think you're getting what you should expect from him. Obviously, I don't think he's going to sustain the crazy pace. I think he was, I last I looked, it was pretty absurd. But he could be a really good he could, if he was a top fifty hitter, nobody should be surprised. It's just a matter of uh, the injury concerns kind of lingered with his draft price this year is kind of the thing. The next guy we're talking about here is going to be Garrett Whitlock. And only for the fact that I found this interesting, obviously the first outing wasn't spectacular, but the slider was way different. It had, had a big dip in velocity, which most people look at as a red flag. But again, with secondaries, when a velo, when there's velo dip, you have to look at the why. all this movement change on the slider. And now for those watching, get to actually see the slider in action. I think just sweeps out of the zone. It's loud. It just sweeps out of the zone. Uh, Rosania threw his bat. We'll watch it one more time. It was just a really just, and that was what that's how it just that movement. And he throws it slower, but it's by three. Trying to get. If we look at his start as a whole, Garrett Whitlock, he was a little down on the sinker as well, but he's also getting more movement on the sinker. More horizontal break means a little more run on it. So this velo dip could be by design because again, Whitlock's getting more movement on his pitches. I, but I, I, I'm encouraged here. And if you're able to buy low or pick them up off the waiver wire in shallower formats, I would definitely consider doing so. Drew Rasmussen, let's look him up. Someone just asked about Drew Rasmussen in the chat. So um, I was, I'm a fan of him. I think the pro, a lot of it is here, though, with, with these guys, with the Rays especially. I, not, I do buy into them, but they also have really cake matchups. I think with Detroit and the Pirates, or I'm trying to remember the – here, we'll look it up real quick. Detroit and Washington. I knew it was oh, sorry, Oakland and Washington. I was like, I knew they had some really cake matchups, and I think they even played Detroit too. Anyway, what we're seeing with Rasmussen, there was I think I've talked about him on the past show. Rasmussen, the thing about him is that he he's he also made changes. Like you can see the strikeouts are way up now. Why is that? He hasn't walked a single batter. That's not going to sustain. And Rasmussen hasn't given up a home run, but he's able to induce more strikeouts while keeping the ball on the ground more than ever, more than the most since 2020, apparently. But uh, all the underlying metrics obviously suggest he's not going to be a freaking a zero ERA guy, but they're all suggesting that pretty much it's legitimate. And if we look at his savant page, because that's where you kind of have to go to see there was some there were some changes there with uh, Rasmussen as well. So we're going to pull that up real quick and dive into it. So we have with Rasmussen, it's the I think he okay sweet I think he added a sweeper that was one thing I remember. No, he utilized it more. No, which what is it? <laughs> Trying to remember what he did. Oh, okay. So the cutter usage is up a little bit. Let's four seams sweeper. Okay, so he's going the same pitch mix. He's actually so last year he had a, he had three pitches he threw at least twenty three percent of the time. This year he's he's leaning heavier on the cutter and four seamer. But uh, oh yeah, that's what it was last outing. It was really weird. He leaned under these two pitches. Pretty much was a two-pitch pitcher, and I'm wondering if it's just because that's all he needed to get by. He's having a lot of success with the cutter fastball combo, and look at this whiff rate—a 43.3 percent whiff rate, whiff rate on the cutter. And that's why I'm like, I remember the cutter being a thing, or was a sweeper. The cutter, okay, so the cutter did have a lot. Of, yeah, so the cutter added a whole bunch of movement. The cutter added about six and a half inches of of uh, vertical movement, while also adding some uh, horizontal movement as well. So that explained why I remember the cutter being a thing. It's just was if we look at his uh game by game log here for the pitches he's through. I remember last I'm almost positive last outing was just a thing like where he didn't need to look. He just kind of like this first outing he really varied up the pitch mix. Through he threw five pitches at least twelve percent of the time, and then this outing he really went heavy into the four seam cutter, and that's where these pitch mixes dipped. So we're still look we still don't know what to expect in terms of where it'll land. But he found success with just two pitches, and he leaned on them. So Rasmussen's not going to overdo it, but knowing he has these three pitches is really encouraging for Rasmussen. The extra, so he has a five pitch mix, and he can utilize them pretty much as needed. That, there's lots of like there. I think Rasmussen, what we're seeing, is pretty legit, and he's figuring something out. But it's also a mix of him being super legit while also having really cake matchups. I but overall, I've I said it like three or four times. I'm uh, I'm in on. Rasmussen and I, I'm buying what we're seeing early on. Somebody asked about Javier Baez. All right, David, let's talk about Javier, Javier Baez. Uh, Javier, not Javier Baez, Javier, Christian Javier. Jeez, I just, brain goes there. I actually looked at him a little bit this morning. I meant to dive in deeper, so we're going to do it together. The strikeouts and walks are down both. I'm wondering if he's attacking the zone a little more. He's obviously, he's having the issues. He is getting more ground balls. Less, and the home runs are actually down a little bit from last year already as well. But the strain rate is up, or sorry, the strain rate's down. That's going to correct itself. 
his his ratios 4.24 ERA with underlying metrics suggesting anywhere from like upper twos to upper fours. So it's a uh, mixed bag here. Let's see the ground ball rate. I'm, oh, I'm gonna go look at the contact and the first pitch strike and all that stuff. So what we're getting here, he's still inducing a ton of O swing, a ton of chases, while inducing the same amount of swinging strike rate as last year. Call strikes are actually up. CSW is about the same. I don't understand what's oh so here he's just get their hitters are making more contact on them. See this? This is what's the issue. So although Javier is inducing a lot of swings, uh, 42% O swing league average, like I mentioned, is like in the 30s, 31.6%. He's inducing a ton of chases. He's inducing good amount of swinging strikes. The issue with Javier right now is he's allowing too much contact. First pitch strike is about the same. His zone contact rate is about the same. Is about the same as last year as well. So it's just a matter of pitchers or hitters are picking up on them a little bit, a lot, a lot of bit more, I guess, than last year, because all this is suggesting that the strikeouts will come. I would say, I don't think he's going to stay, remain this hittable. He's just obviously staying. He's, he's not even attacking the zone more. He's just the pitcher, the pitches in the zone and the overall, even the pitches outside the zone hitters are just making more contact on, but considering again, considering just how much, how many chases Javier is getting, and the swing strike rate being right in place with last year, I think those strikeouts are going to come. I like, I do still think that there's plenty to like here. There seems to just be some bad luck going on with the strikeouts. The bad bip is at 308. That's high for him as well. Again, we talked about the strand rate being high. I, I think I think he's going to be just fine. There's no alarm bells going off. I can look up his savant page C just to check on the maybe the velocity is down or something. I think the velocity might be down a small amount. So but I don't think there was anything overly long. You see, look, look at the slider. If anyone's watching, you see it. If you're listening, the slider placement, he's all he's just down the middle with it. Look at the, the hot and cold zones. He's and the four seamer catching more of the middle than the up. He's trying to attack up in the zone with the four seamer. He's sitting in the middle a lot. That's part of the issue. He's missing his spots. So although his stuff has still been good in terms of inducing swings, inducing chases, Javier is hitting the zone way. He's just in the zone too much right now. And that slider placement, it's literally a red line from top to bottom down the middle. And then the fastball is like the hottest of the hot zone is right there, is like right above the middle, like middle, middle of the plate, with some of it hitting at the top of the zone where he's actually aiming for. Uh, but other than that, the velocity, yeah, see the velocity's down about a tick right now. That's I'm not really again, not overly concerned. Down about a mile per hour on the slider and fastball for Javier. I think Javier's gonna be fine, but right now he's gotta figure out to, how to not throw the ball down the middle. That's really what we're doing here. So Thank you for the uh, question. I love looking into players live. Let's get back to, let's see who we got. Oh, so there's a couple guys. I actually, so we're going to do this together. I didn't look these guys up too much. I do have some notes on Lenin Sosa. I believe it's actually Lenin. I heard an announcer call him Lenin Sosa. Making his debut today, batting, I think, seventh or eighth. I think it's seventh for Lenin Sosa, eighth for Edward, Edward Julian. And I don't know if they're both short-term call-ups. I know Polanco's on a rehab. But can Polanco play shortstop if Cray misses time? I don't – it's hard to see. It could, I think Julian can determine how it turns out for him. But when we get to uh, Sosa's – Sosa, I already have the notes on, but so it's not really as much fun. But Lenin Sosa crushed it in AAA prior to the call-up, walking more than striking out. And that's it's, it's impressive. You have that type of play discipline. He was initially go, going to fight for that starting second base job. There was a little bit of a setback in spring, which led to them sign. I guess they said they obviously signed Andrews. Andrews right now slotted over the, to shortstop. So right now you're going to have Sosa playing second. I think Sosa is another one. It's just going to depend on his performance. If Sosa's hit, hitting, the way they treated Oscar Colas tells me that if Sosa's hitting, they're going to make a spot for him in this lineup. They're not going to, I don't think they're going to sit him for a Andrews if Sosa is playing very well. So I think there's a better chance maybe for Sosa sticking just because it's Julian can definitely stick as well. And the thing about Julian, he walks so much, but he also strikes out a ton and the strikeouts are a passivity thing. I would think, cause look at that. <laughs> You're, he's walking damn near 20% of the time, three straight stops, three straight seasons. I mean, and the strikeouts are up to upwards of 30% in two of those. And it's, again, it just comes off to me as a, he's very passive. It reminds me a lot of old Nathaniel Lowe and Josh Lowe and, these guys that just are have a really good eye at the plate, but pitchers will take advantage of that. We saw we saw Julian, you know, do well in spring and all that, and hit a couple home runs in the WBC. But I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how 
or what to expect here in terms of like, will he be able to still succeed like this or are 50 percent of his bats going to land in a walk or strikeout uh, in spite of being overly passive? Julian has shown plenty of capabilities of still hitting for good average and obviously the OBP is really good. WRC pluses. The guy is a way above average player. And it's one of those things where I'm like, there's power speed, super intriguing guy. I don't, I haven't decided if I want to be aggressive or not. I think, and we get a little bit of a look at him this week to see how we should feel about it, but it's going to be, it's tough because him and Sosa both have this potential of like, why wouldn't they stick if they perform, but they also have ways of getting blocked. So it's, mixed bag in terms of being a in terms of being like a sure it's not really a sure thing but it feels like it could definitely stick and these guys could be potential difference makers for fantasy purposes especially in deeper formats um i appreciate it martin martin says he's joining the patreon you can too with uh just patreon.com slash gte fantasy you could check out all the stuff we have there this is just some of the stuff i'm covering almost on a daily basis you're getting an inside look at the notes i pretty much post daily to the patreon along with other stuff you know there's a discord and all the there's so much we have going on over there another guy people wanted to talk about was tovar and i wasn't a huge tovar guy i did get sucked into a couple shares just because i'm like I, it was a fomo guy for me for sure and i just looking at tovar it's like he's doing you know he's not striking out a whole lot his babip is 300 which actually isn't bad it actually expected to be closer to 333 he has cores you know he's only hitting 225 he has not walked once which he's never been a huge walk guy, but to not walk once is weird. He makes a lot of contact, but he's not a big power bat. You know, he has potential for like extra base hits and some pop, especially in cores, but 46.4% ground ball rate. He's always been a ground ball guy. He's hitting 32% fly balls and 21% uh, line drives. That's solid, but I don't know. It's just, there's not enough juice there. He's not running. The Rockies as a whole have two stolen bases on the year and three attempts. Uh, Tovar swing strike rate. Worse than league average, chasing more than league average, making decent contact in the process though. He's still keeping the uh, the contact rates rather okay, but they're not. It's not good quality contact. He's batting ninth. Tovar, I, I made the comment. And I'm not sure I even mean this tongue in cheek anymore, but there's a there's a legit chance Bryce Trang is what we hoped Tovar to be, and I have a hard time making that flip in leagues. I, I came say I suggest it because I am scared of being wrong on this, but Tovar is just. He's playing every day and he has cores to call home. You don't drop him, that's for sure. But he is someone I've sat in leagues where I have him for reference. And there was one more player, I think. That, oh, Gunnar Henderson. We talked about him the other day. His playing time versus lefties is trending the wrong direction in terms of, I think he sat two or five against lefties and batting eighth now against the last two he has started against. He's a guy that 60, what, over 60% of his plate appearances end in strikeout or walk. Walks, he is gonna come around though. He's he's making he's he hits the ball hard. His bad bip is 214, but he's just not swinging. I think it's a passivity thing with him. If remember, if memory serves, we're gonna double check it. Yes. So even with that, even with that strikeout rate being 40, percent his his swing and strike rate's only 13.6 percent. Again, not much over league average. He's making 82 percent uh zone contact rate, which again, league average is about 85 percent. So he's slightly below average, but the fact that he's only swinging 35 percent of the time. And 40, that's that's 11 and a half percent below your typical swing rate in, in, in the majors. And he's still making contact nearly league average. He's being very passive, picking his spots and making contact when he does swing, it looks like. It's just not working out for him right now. I do think Henderson's going to be just fine. He still has that power speed combination. Uh, he needs a, He just needs to be a little more aggressive, I would say. Ground ball rate's 46.7%. That's not ideal, but he's a guy with speed that he can outplay that ground ball rate being an issue. And somebody asked me about Ronnie Mauricio. I'm not a prospect guy. I do know that, like, I do know Ronnie Mauricio came up last year, had a big, had a had like that breakout uh, minor league campaign, big time spring. And right now he's kind of carrying over the gains, which is great. It's what you want to see. So in double A last year, Mauricio, uh, you know, really, again, the big improvements showed last year. The strikeout rates took a huge jump in the right direction this year. Spring, he had a big spring, and the strikeout rates are carrying over into Triple A. Mauricio is only 22 years old, four home runs of stolen base. The power and speed we saw last year 26 and 20 home runs and stolen bases, legitimate. The BABIP is a little inflated right now, 360, and hitting for 361, that won't sustain. However, again, the growth in the batting, the growth in the plate discipline is where, where I'm really encouraged for Mauricio. And this is a team with the Mets where I'm surprised they just they could use some pop in the back of the line, they can use some upside, they can use some help. And Mauricio. I don't know how long. I think he'd be a short term. I think he's a stash and redraft. He's it's, he's got to be up soon if he's gonna keep, if he keeps this up. He is playing way too well not to get a shot, and he had such a big spring. 
they sh- the Mets would do would be they'd be better off giving a guy like that a spot in the back of the the roster. It's a matter of um, I want to say how do they utilize this? I'm gonna pull this. I gotta look it up real quick. How do they? I can just do it right here. How do they utilize their outfield? I always forget because it's like they can move people around to make it work. Because Mauricio plays what third base or shortstop? I'm trying to remember. Well, no, I think it's short, is it shortstop. It's outfield. I don't remember where he even plays. Shortstop. I thought it was a shortstop, but let's see where he's actually been playing this year. That will matter because 2022 he was okay. DH doesn't help me at all. 2022, where is he playing? Shortstop. So he's only played shortstop. That's the issue. However, he's also a bigger guy. I think he's like really tall. Right? He's a uh, six three. He looks lanky. Anyway. It's not the best podcasting. I apologize, but I'm just thinking because who's he gonna, you know, who's he gonna play for? You gotta figure. Okay, maybe he could take over second base. They can move Jeff McNeil to the outfield. Maybe he could play third base because Escobar sucks. But they have Brett Beatty coming up. I think Beatty is actually the stash ahead of Mauricio. But that's the thing. They should be able to move McNeil, put him in um, maybe left field, get rid of Canna, put Canna on the bench as a fourth outfielder type, and let the kids come up and see what they can do. That's the only thing I could think of would probably work. But again, we're, we've only seen Mauricio play shortstop, so he's not even getting the reps at a different position, which is why I don't know if that's going to be what they do. And I think, oh, Brandon Fett, it's a matter of, I think he might be a June call up at this point. He had, like, there's no reason why he shouldn't be up. He had a bad first outing, a better second outing. He's 24 years old. No reason why they're holding him down. He's having a strong overall decent start to, to his season. Not great. Again, the first outing was really bad. Second outing was a lot better for Fat. And I don't see why he can't break this rotation. You have Mad Bum, who's like old and decrepit. <laughs> you have other just less interesting, less quality options. Uh, it's I think it's gonna be shorter than longer. It might be, hopefully may, but I'm thinking June at this point, unfortunately. But Brandon Fat does have uh, upside there. So I appreciate the questions. I appreciate everything else. Baseball's on. I'm going to head out and go watch some, but uh, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash GT fantasy or at GT fantasy subscribe today and the, the podcast bases loaded podcast. So if you watch these and you, you have to get going, you can listen to them on the podcast feed, the bases loaded, the bases loaded podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. It's greatly appreciated. And we'll talk again soon.